All right, folks, thank you so much for, for coming this evening. My name's Randy Minotaur. I am still the president of Rochester Birding Association. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all. And we're going to have a wonderful speaker this evening. Hello, I haven't had a chance to Hello. introduce Hello. myself because everyone That's wants okay. to talk to you, but hi. Hello. Um, I, have, I have a bunch of announcements, so I hope you'll bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, first, we have three terrific field trips coming up. Uh, November 26th on the Niagara River, that's a joint trip with the Buffalo folks. Uh, that's always wonderful, uh, fascinating going through all of those gulls, trying to find the one or two that are different. Um, always productive, a lot of fun. Uh, on Saturday, December 2nd, we'll be down in Canisius Lake. Uh, always a great trip for winter waterfowl and starting to get those lists going for your for your winter. And on December 10th, we'll have a beginner trip at Nations Road, where, among other things, of course, you'll be viewing uh, short eared owls. So that's always, you know, we hope. So, you know, that's always a fun thing. So uh, those are all coming up. Um, our speaker next month. And next month, the meeting is going to be a little bit complicated, but uh, the speaker next month will be Scott Wiedensall, very well-known author and researcher and has written some, he's written New York Times bestselling books. So uh, we had the pleasure, uh, Dominic and I had the pleasure of seeing him and Nick uh, last year at the, uh, at, at the NISOA conference. He's a terrific speaker, but he'll be coming to us over Zoom. Uh, we're still going to meet in the room here, though. Um, we're, originally, it was just going to be a Zoom meeting, but we're going to meet in both places because we have a thing we have to do. Um, if you read The Little Gull this month, uh, when, it, when it came uh, last week, um, you may have noticed that we're going to have a change to the bylaws. Uh, we're going to ask you if we can have a change to the bylaws. Here's the deal. Nobody wants to be president of the Rochester Birding Association. We cannot find somebody to take over for me, and my term is coming to an end. According to the bylaws, I can only be president for two years. So what do we do? Do we? How do we function without a president? Well, as it became clear that as immediate past president, I would still be running the thing, um, then uh, it seems like this is a good time to look at this, to have a contingency plan that's built into the bylaws. So we have we have a, a small committee that uh, got together and wrote a new bylaw of what to do when nobody wants to be president. And that's what's in this month's little goal. So uh, please take a look at that because we're gonna vote on it in the December meeting. And uh, it's just going to be a majority of whoever is at that meeting, including the folks on Zoom. But we do want to make sure that we have a quorum, which is 10% of our membership. So uh, really want you to participate either in the room or on Zoom in December. And thank goodness we have a terrific speaker. So you'll want to be there. So that's what th that is what that is uh, about. Um, now, uh, also coming up is uh, next Tuesday is Birds and Brews. Uh, we're going to be at Knucklehead Craft Brewing at 426 Ridge Road in Webster. Uh, we've had really good turnout for Birds and Brews the last couple of months, so I hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. That's from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, also, uh, coming up in December, the Christmas bird count. If you haven't heard from the leader you usually go out and do bird count with, uh, you should be hearing from them soon. I've already heard from Shirley from our, from our group. So, uh, uh, if you've never done a Christmas bird count, it's, it's a lot of fun because every bird counts, you know, that, that's the whole point of it. You don't have to be some super birder. You can just be somebody who likes to look at Robins and Cardinals and Blue Jays because that's what you're going to see. Um, and, but you're part of citizen science that the whole world does this Christmas bird count this time of year. So it's really, it's worth participating. It's a lot of fun. Uh, please come and join us and, and be part of, part of the experience. Um, 
something I want to bring to your attention if you haven't noticed it. We have merchandise. We have logo merchandise. Kevin Farrell on our board has taken us through the process. We have a new logo and now we have new merchandise. It's up on the website. There's a big blue button that says merchandise in the top right hand corner of the homepage. So please go to rochesterbirding.org and you buy yourself a t-shirt or a polo shirt or a sweatshirt or something that that uh, that you're going to enjoy wearing out in the field. So all of those things are going on. And now I would like to uh, ask Dominic Sharoni to come up and tell you something very exciting that's happening to him. Thank you very much. Um, Randy and myself have been working on a book about birds. Um, I, this all started uh, in 2011 when I gave a program on birds at an Osher um, adult education um, event in Arizona. That was uh, three, three two-hour lectures on the life of birds. And in 2017, I began to write that up, uh, write up those lectures, and eventually it became a book. The book is going to be published soon. It will it will be delivered by the publisher, available from the publisher on February the 6th, according to the most recent information. It's being published by McFarlane Public Publications. And the name of the book is, um, sorry, I just really, I got it. Feathered Marvels, the, the Natural History and Extraordinary Lives of Birds. I think most people would enjoy reading this book. Um, so uh, I just wanted to announce it to the club. Thank you. Yeah, Dominic is very generous. My role in this was just grammar and composition. Uh, so, but it's it's his life's work, and and I'm just so blessed to have been part of this process. Um, all right, and with that, David, I will turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Randy. Tonight's speaker goes by T H, but I'll try to pronounce his name correctly. John Francois Thurian. Did I get it right? Yeah, that's pretty good. He has a biology a PhD in biology and joined Hawk Mountain in 2011 after completing an academic internship with Hawk Mountain in the fall of 2002. He returned nine years later as a biologist. He now leads the sanctuary's research pro projects in the Arctic and is involved in several studies, including the movement ecology of new world vultures and peregrine falcons across the Americas. He also oversees the all of the associated graduate students studying raptor ecology worldwide. When he's not monitoring long-term American kestrel nest boxes or program or helping the migration counts from the sanctuary, he can be found teaching statistics to sanctuary trainees and enjoying life with his wife and two children. Went to school in Shelbrook, University and Laval University in Quebec. Please welcome Chief. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. I think my microphone is on. You can hear me okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And here it is. Of course, when we talk about, I mean, I was talking with David and he asked me to um, give an overview of the research we do with snowy owls. And I hope this is not gonna be something that you've seen because I was asking when you work on snowy owl, a lot of people ask you about how, what's the life of snowy owl? Can you give a talk? So I gave a similar talk at Braddock Bay, um, but there's also always new stuff. And of course, Tom's in the front row. So, uh, I mean, I need, to, I need to try to <laughs> impress Tom because he knows pretty much everything about snowy owls. 
the one thing I want to say is if you we do study snowy owls, but snowy owls is one of the species we do studies. Uh, we do study a lot of birds, especially my speciality is with raptors, but we study all sorts of birds. Uh, I grew up in Quebec, so I still have the French accent. You can call me JF if you want. Um, I work at Hawk Mountain. I've been there for 12 years. French accent is still there. Um, the talk, I like to call it taking the pulse because this is what we do with birds as we study them. The first thing you do if you go, you get to the doctor, you get your exam, what did they do? They take the pulse. How is it going? And this is exactly what we do with, with raptors, but other birds when we do studies. We have partners around the world. One of my study sites is up in the Arctic, uh, but we do migration count. We do nest box program in Pennsylvania and Quebec and elsewhere. All of the time, what we do, we're taking the pulse. How are those species doing? Are they increasing? Are they stable? And are, or are they declining? And if so, what are the causes? of this? I like also to start by acknowledging that this is not a one-man show. There's a lot of people involved with all those projects. Uh, I think all those names here are associated with work with our Arctic raptors. Um, of course, McDonald's somewhere. Um, and all the organization helping out with all the work that we do. So we, it takes a village to do whatever you want to do. But basically, in here, we have people from all over the world, the Norwegians, the Danish people working in Greenland, uh, people in Alaska, in the southern part of the range for snowy owls, which is our state, New York State. Uh, I grew up in southern Quebec. Uh, we have people from all over the place. We have people specialized in fieldwork component. How do you study snowy owls? For many things that we do, we need to capture the bird if we want to take a blood sample, if we want to put a transmitter on, if we want to assess their body condition. You need to capture the birds. They're not coming to you. So you need to trick them into coming to your trap. And for that, Tom is a big, is a big expert. Uh, but you need statisticians. You need geneticists. You need people doing lab analysis. They're veterinarians on that list as well. So all these people together, we are able to make significant uh, contribution and understanding of snowy owls and other species. Uh, I like to say, well, yeah, taking the pulse, that every species is telling us a story. It's up to us to listen. What are they telling us? Is the population going high or low, or is it stable? And if so, why? So we're trying to elucidate those. We do that with international collaborations. Birds know no boundaries. They cross boundaries like there's nothing. And this is something for us as well to think. We need partners around the world. And again, no one, no, none of this work can be done by just one person. So we have uh, watch sites, other study sites spanning the continent in northwest, east, uh, south, all directions. Um, and we study those guys. Like I said, I like, I'm specialized with raptors, but I study other birds as well. But it starts with Rough-legged and snowies up from the Arctic to peregrine, golden, red-tailed, osprey, um, broadwing hawks, all the way down to the tropics and South America and elsewhere. Up in the Arctic, we study those guys. Those are the northern raptors, the northern cousin of the same, the similar species, but from the south. So, you know, you're familiar with all those species, right? Or you're not, maybe not. Snowy owl, well, it doesn't need introduction. Everyone who has watched a Harry Potter movie know this bird. The rough-legged hawk, which is the northern cousin for the red tail. Red tail is quite common at our latitude, especially in spring, summer, and fall. In the wintertime, we see rough-legged, although they're, I mean, decreasing in abundance in some years uh, over some, some winters. Um, the Jira falcon, which is the tall, big cousin of the peregrine falcon. And we have the peregrine from the tundra, the tundria subspecies, uh, which is the northern cousin for those guys. Great horn owl, red tail hawk, and peregrine falcon, the anatom subspecies. So up in the Arctic, well, this is me. Uh, after a few days out in the field, uh, need a shave, need a shower. But still, it's a great place to work. We study those guys. I'm the raptor, the, the guy working with raptors over there. We're me measuring uh, how many nests that we can see on a given study site, how many chicks are they producing, 
what is the growth rate of those chicks. So right here, I have a little pocket where I put one of the chick in, there's a spring scale, so I can assess how big the chick is, and I'll come back seven to 10 days later to do the same and see their growth rate. I'm lucky and grateful to be part of a bigger team, which is the Biot Island uh, Monitoring Project. We do, and with partners, we study the whole ecosystem. Everything out there in the ecosystem is being studied, uh, being the plants, Whatever the predators, the, the snowy owls and rough-legged hawk, what do they eat? Well, they eat lemmings, small mammal, which looks like a mouse. We have people studying those guys. We have people studying shorebirds, geese, foxes, the glaciers, all of the above. And we do that all the way up here. So this is the, um, I mean, North America, um, the tundra ecosystem, which is where snowy owls and rough-legged hawk can nest so it's above the tree uh, the tree line it goes in northern quebec and then where we work is over here in canadian arctic i'll show you on the map so this is violet island it's pretty up north it's there's no road to get there <laughs> it, in the summertime it's 24 hour daylight the sun never set it just goes around and around so it's uh it's a i grew up in canada but this is a different planet it's so different in ecosystem than i'm used to but it's it's a very uh, beautiful one uh we have uh, and yeah people ask me so how, how do you get there there's no road so we take plane uh, there's a commercial plane that goes from either philadelphia or new york newark to quebec city or ottawa and then we go to a halloween up in the arctic um here which is an inuit community but you're still not here, there so you need a smaller plane that gets you here to um it's, it's on cambridge bay and you have a uh, resolute bay but then you're still not on bylaw so you need a smaller plane that brings you to pond inlet which is the inuit community the northern community here at the tip of, of baffin island but yet you're still not on the study site so you need a smaller mean of transportation that brings you finally the last kilometers to hop through the channel and on the on the Bilot Island. It's a long way to get there. It takes several days because if you, the weather is not cooperating, you're stuck in the fog. But once you get there, it's lovely. It's a nice place to be. This is the Inuit community. This is uh, the um, water channel, and then you see Bilot Island on the other side with the mountains. So it's a very pretty landscape. And we work in close collaborations with Inuits. We have people from the community. Uh, they're all interested in the wildlife over there. They're very, very fond of wildlife stories. They want to know what the birds are doing, how well are they doing. Very curious people because they're surviving living out of the land. So they know if they've seen a lot of caribou and reindeer or um, any uh, or, or um, salmon in the river. So they know they're very uh, sensitive to the environment and they're great allies uh, when we do the work up there. So this is Terry is a high school student. He was working with us one summer. He's uh, actually looking at a snowy owl's nest right there. And this is what it looks like. So it's a mix of wetlands and upper dry land. The raptors typically nest over there. We have other predators uh, living in those uh, habitat, like the Jaegers, the gulls, uh, foxes can roam around across all those ecosystems. Uh, but yeah, the raptors are basically going in those hills. Um, we have to deal with uh, putting up a camp. So you get the, the food dropped, all the tent, the equipment. Um, so it's very, it's very physical work. And then this is what it looks like. It's a nice playground up in the Arctic where we have the main camp, um, like I said, 24 hour daylight. So we sleep in small tents, camping for three months. Uh, there's a cooking tent, there's a lab tent where we can process analysis uh, samples and we have computers, but it's a nice view around. It's a very beautiful place. You'll notice the fence, the little picket, the little uh, post, the white post, because we're in polar bear country. So we uh, need to be careful and Carry if uh, happens, the, there's a guy here with a 12-gauge shotgun. 
in case something would happen. Nothing ever happened. Uh, we've been doing work at that at that camp for 30, 31 year now. And but we we need to be careful. We need to remember how do we dispose of leftovers, food, leftover food. Um, whatever we do, we need to keep in mind we're in polar bear country. So, um, but sometimes we see them from afar, and it's a it's a treat to see them. Uh, so it's a beautiful place. Obviously, all those pictures are taken when it's sunny. Um, it's the Arctic. So this this happens too. This is early June. <laughs> do, you, do you ever had a snowstorm in early June? Uh, not where I grew up. Where I grew up in the southern Quebec, it's still. I mean, the summer's short, but it's it's never like that. Uh, but people asking me, well, you grew up in southern Quebec and you're still going up to the Arctic in the summertime. You don't have any summer. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> but it's a great place. It's a beautiful place. Everything's in bloom and, and booming and reproduction for three months. You get spring, summer and fall pack in three months and you got beautiful scenery uh, like this one. This is a main camp. And I like to quote one of the famous Canadian author. Uh, Farley Mowat. If you haven't read People of the Deer, this is a great book to read. It compares walking up in the tundra as an Arctic fever. It's a disease. It doesn't affect you, but you, you, you're you addicted. You want to go back. You want to just walk out in the tundra because of the big spaces. And it just it's good for your mind. I feel it's good for the mind. And then on Baila, we're lucky because it's a bird sanctuary. There's a whole lot of birds that you can't see. And there's no tree. So you put up a scope and you see far away. You see the sandhill crane doing their courtship behavior. There's a big snow goose colony. Uh, you see the shorebirds, the water bird. Um, there's a lot to see. And the predators, I'm the raptor guy. Well, there's a nice set and suite of um, predators as well that we study. So we have those guys. We're monitoring all of them to see are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they doing OK? Uh, and so on. And we're doing that at Violet, but we're doing that also with other people elsewhere. So we're trying to get a snapshot from the Arctic every year. Obviously, the most complete site is the one, the study happening on Violet, but all those sites are doing some of the work to uh, monitoring some of those species. And so what we do, we're measuring how is the ecosystem functioning? People are saying, well, it's the Arctic tundra. It's a simple ecosystem. It's easy to measure. Well, people who say that never done it because it's, it's, it's harder than it looks like. There's a lot of species. They're all interacting. But we, we're the team we have, we're lucky because we can put it in numbers. We're studying those guys, which are the main herbivores. This is the, the size of a vole or a small mouse. Uh, they call lemming. They're kind of bulky. They're made for the cold. Um, and they're eating uh, grass and vegetables. In the Arctic, they show tremendous variation in abundance. From one year to the next, you see a lot of lemmings some years. And then in between, you have very few of them. And then they bounce back. And they go down. And they bounce back. Every four years, in average, you get a peak in abundance. Peak in abundance of lemming, which is one of the main prey item for the snowy owl, gives you the pattern that we see here, the numbers of nests of snowy owls. So it mirrors the abundance of lemmings. When there's numerous lemmings, high abundance of lemming, you have a high abundance of snowy owls' nests. I guess they're delicious, the lemming. I've never tried one, but people say they're delicious. Snowy owl think they're delicious. And so you see those kind of images. This is a snowy owl nest. Uh, because I, we walk and we monitor them, we count the chicks. So because I walked up to, to monitor the nest, the, both parents just flew away, but they're coming back super fast after I'm leaving. But the commanding view up the hill, they're looking around. This is the typical snowy owl's uh, nest. This is what it looks like. They're very cute. Look at those guys. And look at the size difference. That's a clutch of about five or six. I think there was an egg that's still hatching underneath all those guys. But the big one, second one, look at this one. So when there's plenty of food, all is good. They're all going to eat. When there's not that much food, well, the big ones are going to be much more capable to compete for the food. And it's going to affect their, their clutch size, the number of fledgling they can, they, they can produce. 
So this is something we do. We're measuring how many chicks, but we're measuring how much food is brought back to the nest. We use trail cams, just like the typical camera, uh, camera trap like people use for uh, hunting or to uh, see who's going in your driveway. Or... So we're using the same, but we're measuring how many times the, the male, I can't play it again, the male brought, brings back lemming per day. So you see the male is bringing back a lemming, there's a female excited to get the lemming for this chick, which is even more excited because it's gonna eat it. And when that's a good year, well, this is the kind of picture you can get. We were talking about this picture right before. This is the nest in Northern Quebec where when I went to the nest, there were 78 lemmings brought back to the nest. The male was very efficient, picking up lemmings on the, on the territory, bringing them back to the female so she can feed the chicks which were just starting to hatch. So chances are all those chicks made it because there was so much food available for them. And obviously the female was in good body condition, same for the male. So when they time it right, they choose a, a, a good location, they can be very successful. Something stored for the immediate future? Yeah. The good thing is they don't go bad because it's the Arctic, it's like in the fridge. So they just they're just okay to and as soon as one of the chicks seems to be hungry, there's something ready for them. This is not the case every year, but on some years it's it can be very, very successful nesting. And then they look like that. It look like they're gonna try to eat you. Uh, they get bigger and meaner and they grow quite fast. And then with all that, I was saying, we all that we put that in, in perspective, all of these boxes represent a species or a group of species that we're measuring and we're monitoring up on Bilet. I'm doing most of the raptor stuff, some of the Jaegers, peregrine, the rough-legged snowy, and all those links, you see how complex, even though it's supposed to be a simple ecosystem, it's still super complex. There's a lot of lines going across uh, so basically those lines are who eats what and how much, how many. Uh, the thicker the line is the thicker the relationship. So there's a lot of predation from those guys on snow geese, either the, the chicks, the goslings, or the eggs. And there's a lot of predation going to the lemming. So those two species are very central to the ecosystem up in the Arctic. And then we're also measuring individual behavior. We're tracking birds when we put a backpack on them. It's just a backpack. Now you don't see the straps because those guys are, have so much, so many feathers. As soon as you put a backpack on them, you, you lose the feathers, uh, the, um, the transmitter harness in, in their feathers. But by tracking them, we can assess precisely where do they go in almost real time. So we can tell habitat use, we can say if they're resting, if they're active, if they're moving, if they're hunting, we can assess that over several weeks, months, and year. And then in turn, we can assess survival rate. When we build a model to conserve species, we want to know the survival, oh, rate, survival of them. rate of them. So by tracking them, it allows us to assess survival rate. So what it gives us is this kind of images. So this is... Um, each color represents one adult female that we trap and tag when they were all neighbors. So for a full year, this is the picture it gives us. All those snowy owls were nesting on Violet Island on one year, and we tracked them for, for more than a year, for more than one year, but this is just the first year because if we put second year, third year, fourth year, and all the birds that we track, it's just a big bowl of spaghetti and we can't see a thing. So this is only the subset, the first one we did up in the Arctic uh, on Bilat and 12 of them. You see the difference in patterns of some of them long distance all the way south of South Dakota and all the way back up in next spring. Look at the yellow one. It went up north in the winter time, 24 hour darkness in the winter time. And look at the, the difference in kilometers between the red one and the yellow one. And so all other question that we were also curious to see was, where do they go next year? Are they gonna nest in the following year? Because when they're plenty of lemmings, they're coming up, they're nesting in huge numbers, but in between those years, we don't know where they go. We don't know if they're nesting. So we track them 
And we were able to go out on the ground and confirm that they were nesting every year. Lots of location, different locations. So all those dots <clears throat> sorry, are places where they actually settled and nested in four consecutive years. So after all being neighbors here, they're spread out. One of them went to Greenland. The other one went to Western Canadian Arctic. And then for four years, we tracked them and they were all coming back to Northern Quebec on the fourth year. So they actually able to find a place where lemmings are numerous and they're nesting successfully at those places. So that predation pressure that they do at one site, they do it elsewhere when there's a lot of lemmings elsewhere. So when you think about climate change or ecosystem integrity, trying to protect the ecosystem, if you remove one of them, you're gonna change the whole equilibrium because this is the predation that they do, keeping the lemmings at lower density so that they don't overbrowse the tundra. Well, if you remove the snowy owl, lemmings will go unchecked. And on the opposite end, if you remove the lemmings, snowy owls won't have anything to feed on. So all those things are so tightly interacted that that's why we are uh, studying them up in the Arctic. When I want to put that in perspective, when you're comparing snowy owl behavior with the southern cousins, so this is gray horn owl, this is roughly where they nest in North America, basically just at the tree line, the tree line in south. And then you compare it with the snowy owls. So the diet of a great horn, which is a generalist, goes for all whatever is available. It doesn't matter, I mean, I'm sure they have preferences, but they can go, if there's a lot of hares, they'll go for them. There's a lot of small mammals, they'll go for them, but they won't move as much as snowy, snowy owls. Snowy owls on the opposite end, when they're nesting, they're focusing 95, 99% of the diet is lemmings. So that's why they need to move quite large distances to actually find them. So it gives you that kind of picture, breeding dispersal. From one year to the next, they need to move quite a bit to find a uh, high lemming, a uh, high abundance of lemmings. If you compare it with great horn, they tend to be resident. They're not migratory. So if you track a great horn owl for several years, well, the result is just going to be a dot because they're not going anywhere. They're staying on territory. They're, they just, that's what they do. They, they live of whatever is there and they don't move. So this is just an example, but this is a contrasting strategy for similar species. If you compare a clutch size of a great horn owl, it's usually two eggs, sometimes one, sometimes three, but in average, they have two eggs, two chicks, and they might fledge two chicks. Snowy owls, well, it's a much different strategy. They could go for two to 11 eggs. If they time it right, if they choose and select a great site, they might raise all 11 chicks to fledging. Yeah, if they time it and it's, it's a situation like this one, well, this could be the result. So this is a family of snowy owl ready to start to move and fledge. So very successful if they have it right. Same kind of strategy if you're comparing the hawk. So red-tailed hawk in the south, uh, rough-legged up in the north. It's not as contrasted as snowies and great horn owl, but it's, it's a similar kind of thing. So a clutch size of a red-tail red would go from between one and five, typically three. Uh, the rough-legged will go from two to seven. If they have it right, they can raise seven chicks to fledging. And then by tracking them, it's not only that we can assess survival rate or habitat use, we can find some sort of surprises. One thing, the first thing that we did is studying them during the winter time. So they were banded up north on Violet. This is the first winter. I'm a young PhD student. I'm putting the tracks on the map and showing that to my advisor. And he looks at it, he's like, are you sure you know what you're doing? I mean, snowy owls out at sea, how is that possible? Go back and do the model again, because I mean, obviously there's something wrong. Well, apparently I was okay because the snowy owl go out at sea in the winter time. That was a new thing that we didn't know they were doing that. They were supposed to be small mammal specialists and they're out there on the sea ice. Whoa. and we didn't know what they were doing for extended periods of time, up to two months, 200 kilometers from the coast. And they did that every winter. So 
when we looked at it, we took a closer look. Don't don't worry about all the points that we put uh, around the blue one, but the red one is a is a location of a snowy owl. This is a picture, a high quality or high resolution satellite image from the Arctic. And it shows most of it sea ice, the gray zone here. And you got an island, but you get this darker patch, which is an open water patch. In the wintertime, even if most of it is ice covered, there's still opening in the water where because of tides, um, the currents, the, the wind, it creates those opening in the water. And snowy owls were all the time, they were sitting right next to the open water patch. So obviously the question we were thinking, well, what, what are they doing? Are they swimming? <laughs> I mean, it's a snowy owl, it's not a duck. They're not going for lemmings. There's no lemming in a water patch. So we start talking about that to colleagues from Canadian Wildlife Service. They're studying uh, long-tailed ducks. They're studying eider ducks up in the Arctic. And the eider ducks are using those open water patches to get to the seafloor and feed on mussels and stuff. And they're coming back and resting on the ice and they say, yeah, we see your snowy owl all the time. They're eating our birds. And we say, well, I'm sorry, but the, we didn't know that, but that's what they do. They actually go, they blend in in the, in the winter with their, their white coat. They blend in and they, they're feeding on some ducks that are uh, not paying attention. So people are asking me, well, do you think a snowy owl is big enough to kill an eider duck. An eider duck is heavier than the snowy owl. When you look at the feet and you compare the feet of a snowy owl, they're pretty big feet. And you compare it to a lemming, you realize, whoa, okay, that's way overkill. I mean, it's a tool that's made for bigger than this. And the picture is worth a thousand words, right? This is a young snowy owl. This isn't a Great Lakes. It's a merganser uh, that the snowy, it's a young bird a few months old that was actually able to kill a merganser and, and fly away with it. So they actually are capable of doing it and they're more than capable. That's one strategy that they do quite a lot. I'm sure, I mean, Tom can say a lot of stories, but where in the, in the winter time, a snowy owl might be looking into the terrestrial ecosystem for rats and pigeons and, and small mammal. But on the other side, there's water and, and ducks and black ducks and mallards so whatever is becoming available or vulnerable or not paying attention, Snowy Owl is more than capable of killing those guys. Mm. Thank you. Honda Civic. So one of the things we're talking when we're studying birds up in the Arctic, but it's not just Arctic species, but people are asking me, well, climate change, how is that going to affect all those species? Um, well, climate change is happening and it's affecting all those species in several ways. For most of them, it's affecting them through complex and broad uh, mechanistic ways it's not a direct impact if you raise the temperature by one degree you're not killing snowy owls outright right away but you're affecting their ecosystem and so it's going to affect their distribution abundance and phenology phenology is the timing of of their activity they're going to start breeding earlier um, or or later giving depending on the food availability and so on so all those things are not as easy as it seems to study. But this is one of the things we want to do. We're, we're actually uh, aiming to assess. Climate change is affecting one of the big things it does. It's reducing uh, sea ice in the wintertime. The parts in red are the places up in Canada where the sea ice is retreating the most. It's actually the places, exactly the place where snowy owls are hanging in the wintertime. So how is that affecting their habitat? It, it's still up to, uh, we're, we're gonna still, we're still measuring how it's affecting their uh, habitat and behavior. But because we know also that they're so tightly linked to, to lemming abundance, and we see that with climate change, lemming abundance, this is a graph from Norway, where the peaks in lemmings 
that tend to be regular in amplitude and timing, they started to fade away. And the reason for that is when you increase temperature by just a few degrees, you're increasing the moisture and uh, it changes the pattern of ice to snow. So instead of having a thick blanket of snow covering the ground, insulating the ground, now you had thin ice crusts where the food, the plants were all uh, encapsulated in ice where the lemmings cannot get to. So you see those peaks in abundance actually fading away and in turn snowy owls because snowy owls in the winter in the summertime they feed on lemmings heavily uh, our no norwegian colleagues for i think it was 14 or 20 years haven't seen any snowy owls in norway nesting they were quite concerned that they've lost snowy owls forever we have a picture of them because luckily 2014 there was a peach and snowy owl responded and they, they went to nest in Norway. But our colleagues from Norway have a picture of them crying because they have a snowy owl back in Norway and they haven't had them for several years. So this is something we're keeping an eye on as well in North America. Uh, this is a picture of, yeah, how, how it's affecting the lemmings. So not only is snowy owls is being affected by climate change, but the cliff ne nesters as well. So rough legged hawk, uh, they tend to nest on those cliffs. Those cliffs are made of permafrost. When the permafrost, or if you have more rain, because you increase temperature by just a little bit, uh, degrees or two, you get more rain, and then those cliffs are actually collapsing, and they're losing their clutch. If that was happening in September or October before, now it's happening earlier when there's still eggs in the, in the nest or chicks. Now, the Arctic season is still too short to to start over again. So when they lose a clutch, they're done for the year. So it's a total failure of their nest. So you see this uh, cliff that kind of collapsed with the nest in. Uh, peregrine falcons also are quite vulnerable to um, rainstorms. This is a camera trap taken from uh, right in front of a peregrine's nest. And the peregrine's actually okay, but it's raining. So the adult's okay, but the two eggs are floating in a puddle. Yeah, because it's raining so much. Just by increasing temperature a little bit, you increase the amount of rain, and in turn, you get those rainstorms where it's not good at all for the, for the eggs or the chicks. Another pretty gruesome way to go is same camera traps where on a very warm day with no wind, the parents are not incubating the youngs because the young peregrines are okay. It's warm enough, but it's warm enough for the chicks, but it's warm enough for black flies. And those poor chicks were bled to death in a matter of 12 hours by black flies. So it's a pretty rough way to go. Some of the stuff we see happening with climate change, because those black flies didn't occur before, and now they're more and more common. They're going up uh, with climate change. So we have female. This is a picture from Norway. Uh, female is totally, the, the eyelids are completely clogged out with black fly bites. Uh, the bird can move, can see an, a human coming to the nest. So they brought the bird to rehab. The bird was okay, but obviously lost its clutch because uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't feed, couldn't uh, fly away. And so this is one of the things that's happening uh, with climate change. Now, I know it's rough, but I like to be positive and say, I mean, we can figure, we can fix it. We have a network of people. This is a picture from the World Owl Conference. It was in... Portugal in 2017, we have a similar picture. We just had the same meeting in Wisconsin two weeks ago. Bunch of people putting together with the same mind of trying to protect those birds. We have uh, changed the status for snowy owl IUCN, which is the world uh, authority on species uh, to make sure that the, the snowy owl is listed as vulnerable. So people pay attention to these and that triggers countries to reassess the, um, the status of their birds. So I'm helping out with the one in Canada. Uh, we're trying to see if it needs additional protection. But this is the kind of thing us scientists, when we work together, we are able to do. We can make those achievements by sharing what we uh, measure and, and uh, making differences. So we put a bunch of people together. We model all those places where we have snowy owls nesting. 
we measuring their growth rate. And this is the kind of picture we get. This is a paper that we just finished working on that we're publishing at the moment. If the growth rate is at one, that big uh, dark line, it means it's a stable population. Wherever you are above, you're increasing in size. If you're below one, you're decreasing. Your population is in de decline. So the blue line is what's happening with snowy owls worldwide at the moment. It's not a sharp decline, but if you look at all the recent years, it's always below one. So now we're trying to raise a flag saying, well, we need to see or we need to figure it out and see what are the limiting factors and see if they need additional protection because we don't want this to be going until we kind of lose the snowy owl. So this is the kind of work we do um, up in the Arctic. I want to highlight other projects I'm involved with, but I don't want to go in too many directions, but I'll still, I'll still do it because uh, like you see, I'm pretty passionate about what I do. Um, so the work in the Arctic happens here and elsewhere but I'm helping out with a count site here in North, in middle of Quebec. It's called Tadoussac. If you're from here, it's not too long of a drive, but if you are into birding, I mean, this is a pretty phenomenal place to go. Tadoussac sits on the St. Lawrence River on the North shore. So all the birds coming down the Boreal Forest, they hit the St. Lawrence and instead of crossing it, they follow it all the way to Quebec City and Montreal before they cross it. So the location of the count site is right here where it's crazy what you can see. In spring, people, there's a guy, I think there, I have a quote. Jan, Jan Davies from eBird wrote that quote. This is, today was the greatest birding day of my life. I mean, he, and he's not a small birder. He's just a, a hardcore one. They counted close to 500,000 warblers in one day. Crazy. He said by the time he did, they did eight hours or nine hours on the, on the sand dunes with binoculars. And during that day, three warblers flew through his legs because there's so many. And they come in at high level. He said this is the, so he's a, he's a fan of the place. But if you have a place you want to visit, Tadoussac is pretty phenomenal. Uh, for songbirds, we have um, a count site where we do raptor counts and we trap. Uh, Sawet, but Boreal Al as well, as well as finches. So there's all sorts of things happening over there uh, if you're interested. And then lastly, the other count site that I'm uh, partnering with is further down south. So this is obviously Florida here, Texas, Mexico, and in Costa Rica. See how all the raptors from North America need to go through that narrow bottleneck if they don't want to cross over, over sea. By staying over land, they need to cross into Costa Rica and Panama, and it creates amazing uh, monitoring places like Kekoli, Costa Rica. You don't see it on the ground, but there's a little dusty here. That's a big group of raptor. If you zoom in, this is the kind of picture you get. Right now, Kekoli, Costa Rica, they're still counting. They still have two weeks to go, but this fall season, they counted 4 million raptors. 4 million. It's unreal. You have days of 100,000 raptors, Swainson's hawk, Broadwing hawks, peregrine, name it. So it's a very phenomenal place. If you're interested and want to visit, uh, it's a great place to go to. These monitoring sites in Tadoussac, in Costa Rica, just like a hawk mountain, we put all those data together to assess how are those species doing? Are they increasing? Are they declining? Are they stable? So there's that raptor population index. If you go on the web, RPI dot uh, or dash index or project. And you can see all those trends for all the sites, for all the species. Just one example, because I could go on for a long time, but you see all those dots either pointing, an arrow pointing up, an arrow pointing down, or a blue dot, which is a stable population. And this is for the American Kestrel for 10 years um, over North America. But you can look at those, those trends for all the species of raptor across the whole flyway. So it's a very powerful tool when we put all of us together. Again, uh, Costa Rica is a great place if you want to support or visit. And I think I'm just going to end here. 
Uh, obviously, we want to protect those guys. We're lucky at Hawk Mountain. We have a phenomenal group and program of trainees, uh, grad, study, grad students, uh, professors. We have uh, lots of grad students working with us. Uh, we have plenty of people eager to make a difference in learning about raptors. And together, I think we can uh, protect those birds for the future. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm here for questions. Before we start the questions, let me just get you the microphone, please. You said that the snowy owls are hanging out in Violet Island. Are they not spread across the entire Canadian and Alaskan Arctic, as well as Norway, Russia, Siberia? Very good question. The question was, if uh, what's the distribution up in the Arctic? Snowy owl occur in all those places, but one year, if there's a high lemming abundance, they'll be present in one site. But then in following years, they, they will desert. They will not be on violet for two, three years in a row before they come back the fourth year. Same for Norway, same for Greenland, same for Alaska. They are nomadic species. So they occur in high numbers, one year, one site, but then they spread out. What do you do when they're not there? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I haven't been up in the Arctic because we missed the last peak in abundance during COVID. 2021 was a huge peak in abundance. 2021 was the second year of the pandemic. Up in the Arctic, the Inuit community uh, had to be very careful of how many travelers would go from the south. So we couldn't go in 2021. And hopefully uh, next year is a good one, but I haven't been back because my colleagues are telling me, well, you can come, but there's no lemmings, there's no owls. You're going to have to do work uh, with us on plants, and I don't want to do plants work. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, their, their work is good. But... <laughs> Go ahead, though. Oh, right. In Europe, you don't have that many lemmings. Um... It's rough on everybody, parasitic Jaegers, outer foxes, snowy owls. And of course they lay fewer eggs mm -hmm. um, in that. What impact do parasitic Jaegers have when snowies um, have fewer eggs, except like fewer eggs. eggs, and there's less food for everybody? Is there a higher impact um, on snowy's nest than that? We see, I mean, the question is how is predation affecting or competition affecting all the, the community. When there's less lemmings, everyone else in the ecosystem is affected by it. Uh, Arctic fox like um, lemmings quite a lot. When there's no lemmings, they predate uh, quite heavily shorebirds and geese, for example. So we see geese nesting success, a big drop, just because lemmings are not there. So. It's uh, all those predators are turning into something else, uh, secondary prey. So for snowies, the good thing with snowies, they can defend their territory against uh, Jaegers, gulls, foxes quite efficiently. Uh, and they won't nest on a given site if lemmings don't reach a threshold. So they're not going to be there at all. If they're there, it's because usually there's a nice lemming abundance. So uh, thankfully, less predation, less competition for them. Thank you. 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 Thank you.